Let's get this uh, slideshow on the road. Helping uh, pro-social behavior. And uh, like my pointer, just to uh, note this, somebody's helping along with the people. Uh, not as a scientific observation, but I've certainly seen lots of situations where dogs will see what people are doing and just join in to help. It's pretty amazing. Not scientific, not really getting to the area of uh, comparative psychology, but pretty close. So uh, this week, I'm going to be essentially building on what the chapter talks about and keeping this lecture pretty simple. So I'm going to talk about, uh, you know, review the death of uh, Catherine Genovese or Kitty Genovese. Uh, then uh, doing that, I'm going to have to uh, review what we know about Darley and Latinay's bystander effect theory. And then finally, I uh, haven't talked about morality and the psychology of morality in class yet. And so what I'd like to do that and talk about it in the context of helping. Whereas based on your morality, one action may be helping uh, while different moralities would see that action as hurting. And that's a very interesting take on pro-social behavior. So let's first, uh, you know, uh, talk about the death of Kitty Genovese. Uh, and uh, that's how she was described in the original newspaper accounts. And this is one of the photos they had of her in the original newspaper accounts. Uh, and we'll get to this uh, in a little bit. But first, let's... Uh, uh, take a look at uh, you know uh, what the uh, standard story and I believe the story in your textbook about her death uh, is also so let me no not there I want to discard that and I want to open this up and here we go in 1964 38 New Yorkers watched through their windows as one of their neighbors was brutally murdered her name was Kitty Genovese, a 28-year-old woman. The Genovese incident where a young woman coming home late at night from her work was assaulted by somebody who was one of those random crazy people. Kitty was running up the block and Winston Mulvey ran after her until she reached the midpoint of the block almost directly under this street line. Mosley caught up with her and stabbed her four times in the back. Her screams were loud, unmistakable, and reverberated throughout the entire area. The lights went on in, in the windows around the courtyard, so we know that people were seeing this Nobody called the police. Somebody who lived on the seventh floor opened his window and yelled out, what's going on down there? When Mosley heard somebody yelling out, he ran back to his car, and he was still alive. She managed to get up. She staggers around the corner here, still screaming. People in that building heard her as well. And she collapses inside this hallway. There's one apartment above here. It was occupied by Carl Ross. Carl opened his door at the time that Mosley returns and he saw the second attack taking place. And he did nothing. After stabbing Kitty another eight times in this very hallway, the killer ran away, leaving Kitty to bleed to death. Eventually, a neighbor called the police, but it was too late. Kitty died before the ambulance could get her to the hospital. That shocked the city. Now, it's not that a person got murdered that shocked the city. That happens, sadly. It's that a person got murdered and her neighbors watched and nobody did anything. And uh, that's the story. Uh, the speaker at the end was John Darley the social psychologist, hopefully, that you recognize, and, uh, or hopefully by now, 
Uh, so that was what uh, New Yorkers and America were discussing. 37 or 38 respectable citizens of Queens uh, watched this killing and did nothing. Uh, and this became uh, not just a big topic in New York City, not just a big topic in uh, New York State, but in America and the world. Uh, here is a, a panel from The Watchmen, a graphic novel, and uh, you know, even uh, over in uh, England, uh, people knew about Kitty Genovese and uh, enough so uh, that it was included in Watchmen. Uh, here is some a photo that showed up sometimes uh, current, you know, you know, during the uh, you know uh, time that people were discussing this of Catherine Genovese. Uh, who was working at a bar. She was coming home from the late shifts at the bar as, where she served as a manager. A much nicer photo than this, but this photo was the one that generally was circulated about her. And again, I, I'm pointing that out for a special reason I'll explain later. And so this really shook America. And so uh, in response, oh, and finally, uh, you know, Winston Mosley, uh, the murderer, uh, he was a serial rapist murderer. He was also a necrophile. Uh, he chose Genovese at random. Uh, we don't really know how. Uh, you know, he it appeared his modus operandi was to drive around, uh, you know, looking for single women. Uh, uh, Genovese was a manager at a bar. She got off work when the bar closed at uh, 2 a.m. She drove home to Queens. The bar was in uh, Brooklyn, I think. She drove home to Queens. Uh, probably either uh, Mosley knew about, you know, watched her get into her car and followed her from Brooklyn, or uh, he saw a woman driving alone at 2 a.m. and then started following her and then followed her to her parking lot of her apartment building. Mosley, by the way, uh, was sentenced to death. His sentence was commuted to life imprisonment and he passed away in 2016. So, as I said, this uh, incident uh, really had a major effect on America. Uh, and so, uh, social psychologists picked on, up on this. Uh, one was John Darley, and there he is. This is the uh, social psychologist we saw in the video clip, uh, and that's a younger version of him in 1971, and his colleague Bib Latinay. And they were interested in studying this, uh, you, know, uh, you know, Genovese phenomenon experimentally. That is, why did all of these people observe the murder but no one took any type of action. Uh, and as you recall from the original video clip I showed you, uh, only one person called the police. And in fact, uh, it was reported that people called each other, uh, neighbors called neighbors to see what they should do, uh, should I call the police, and they didn't. And these were uh, concurrent st stories uh, at the time in the newspapers and, mag and news magazines. So what uh, Latin and Darley decided to do was to experimentally replicate this situation. And so their replication in the lab of this situation was this. You're a, you know, a psych major and you're in the research pool or you're an uh, intro psych student and you're in the research pool. You sign up for a, an experiment on, called Getting to Know You and you show up in the lab and you're told that uh, you know, what you need to do is, is go down to this cubicle B and go into cubicle B and sit down and uh, you know, put on the headphones and wait for instructions. And so you go down to the cubicle, uh, you know, you shut yourself in the cubicle, no, it's just a little phone booth sized thing. Oh, I hope you know what a phone booth is. And <laughs> it's a very small room and uh, you're there alone and you're uh, sitting in front of a microphone and you have some headphones on. Uh, in a few minutes, the experimenter comes on the headphones saying that uh, you know, you're in there with several other 
uh, students. You're in this experiment with several other students, each one individually in a cubicle. And what we want to do is study very scientifically the process of how people get to know each other. And you're in the individual cubicle because we would like to record on a different channel each person's comments so we can analyze them. So the, that's a deceptive cover story, but it's a very realistic and believable cover story. And so what you're told is uh, we're going to start and each of the seven people are, or each of the X people are going to be asked a question and then you'll have 90 seconds to respond to it. And then you'll hear a, a ping and then the channel will switch to the next person and the next person can talk to everybody and then you'll hear a ping and you go to the next person. And so it begins with tell us a little about, bit about yourself and so you hear, you know, one uh, other student start talking and then ping and then it goes to the next channel and you hear another student talking, ping, goes to another channel and then you hear another student talking and they're saying, well, you know, uh, I'm a psych major and I'm really glad to be back in college. Uh, I had a concussion last year and afterwards I developed, you know, very, very serious epilepsy and I had to be hospitalized for a long time. Finally, the doctors felt it was under control and they can get me back uh, to college. So I'm really glad uh, you know, that the doctors were able to help me. Bing, and then it goes to you and you say whatever you want. And then you cycle through a couple other questions and then you're going through one of the other questions and it's getting to the student who has epilepsy and he's saying, and you know, oh, oh, oh wait, oh God, I, no, I'm starting to have an epileptic seizure. Oh my, this is a bad one. Somebody get help. Oh, oh. And then you hear nothing uh, until like, you know, 59 seconds later when you hear bing and then it goes to you. And then what do you do? You can't talk to the other, uh, you know, uh, subjects in the experiment. So do you actually get out of your cubicle and go and try to find help? Uh, that's what the experiment was. The dependent variable was whether or not you helped operationally defined by getting out of the room and looking for help. Uh, and the independent variable was the number of bystanders. And the way Latin and Darley visualized this was you were the helper and everyone else there was a bystander. And as I mentioned, uh, there was a deceptive element of the study in that you were literally the only real subject. Everything else was recorded on a machine and played back. Uh, it was very believable to the students, uh, but you were the only one there. And uh, they manipulated the number of other subjects that you felt that were in the experiment. So you're sitting there, you hear somebody have a seizure, you know it's just you and one other person versus you and four other people. Uh, what's the effect of having all of those other bystanders there on whether or not you get up and help? And here's what they found. Uh, here we have the number of bystanders, one other, so you and just one other person, five, uh, you and, uh, four, uh, and five other people. Uh, so you hear uh, the student have the seizure and it's you and somebody else. And 85% of the real subjects get up and they open the door and they look for help. Uh, so that's the operational definition of helping. Uh, but notice as you go from one to two uh, bystanders to five, the amount of helping drops down to 31%. So again, uh, Darley and Latine were so happy because uh, they had replicated the, uh, what they called the Genovese effect in the laboratory. That is, the greater the number of bystanders, the, greater, the less help given. Also, you see here, this is the time until somebody helps. And with one other bystander, uh, you help you get up and open the door in about a minute. With two others, it takes 93 seconds, and it takes 166 seconds if there are five others. So we see not only in whether or not help is given, but uh, in, you know how long it takes until it's given, that the number of bystanders somehow inhibits 
an individual's willingness or you know uh, decision to help and also retards how quickly that help will come and so this bystander effect uh, that they found in the laboratory pretty much parallels what could have been going on uh, in Kew Gardens, Queens. Uh, that is, uh, you knew that dozens of other people were watching. You saw lights being turned on as people uh, you know, woke up to see what was going on. And so, at, you know, because you knew a whole lot of other people were watching, your own uh, you know, desire to help or motivation to help was lowered. And the problem was that occurred to everybody. And so if everybody was saying somebody else will do it, uh, that's an assumption that I'll talk about in a minute, uh, then nobody helped. And that's what seemed to have happened with Kitty Genovese. Uh, so we have the bystander effect. And what did Darley and Lantanay uh, say about it? Uh, they said that bystanders uh, experience a diffusion of responsibility. Uh, that is, when you're witnesses to an emergency, you share the responsibility. And the more bystanders, bystanders, the less uh, one feels responsible to act. That is, there's a given set of responsibility in a situation, and if I'm the only person there, all the responsibility is on me. If there's another person, 50% is on me. If there's two other people, only a third. And so that's what they're thinking was this uh, responsibility is a set quantity, and the more people there, the more diffuse it gets. The problem is it gets more and more diffuse uh, you know, for everybody. And so if there's so many people there, uh, nobody feels enough responsibility individually to do anything. Uh, and research has shown that even thinking about a group of people can result in less helping uh, because this is an implicit bystander effect. That is, cognitively thinking about uh, this. And so, you know, even just thinking about a large group of people being with you will tend to uh, inhibit your ability to want to uh, respond. But, you know, I'm talking about this because we have to talk about, is this really the case? Is this what's going on? So, uh, let's talk a little bit and let me review a little bit about what the textbook said about uh, Darley and Latinay's theory. Darley and Latinay said that there are five steps to helping versus not helping that people go through. And this diffusion of responsibility only shows up in one of them. So uh, the first step is that you have to notice or fail to notice that something unusual is happening. Uh, and they saw it as evidence of this a study by uh, Darley and Batson in 1973, uh, where the less uh, where people are less likely to help if they're in a hurry. Uh, and very interesting study. They used seminary students, and they had them show up to the uh, psych department uh, to the lab, and they were told to prepare a talk on a you know prepare a sermon and they would go uh, next door to this, uh, a, a TV studio and record the sermon. And uh, this is part of an, a psychology experiment on something or other. There was a cover story. And then uh, they were told, okay, you have to go next door to the uh, studio to uh, you know, take a look, you know, to record this uh, sermon. And they told uh, some uh, subjects that, oh, by the way, we're ahead of schedule for this uh, studio, so you know, d you know, you know, there's no rush getting over. Others were told, oh, uh, we're on schedule. Uh, the studio costs money, so make sure that you get over there in five minutes. And then some were told, we're behind schedule, and uh, we really need you to get over there as quickly as possible. When the seminary students got to the uh, uh, ground level and cross the street, there was somebody laying in the curb in front of them. Uh, and uh, the question was whether or not the seminary students would stop and help the uh, person laying on the street. And as we can see here, the amount of hurry or the amount of uh, time pressure they felt determined whether or not they would stop to help and also, after debriefing them, whether or not they noticed anybody at all. 
uh, when they had no time pressure. 63% stopped and inquired about the uh, welfare of the person laying on the street when they were told they were on schedule but they needed to get over there. 45%, about half, noticed somebody and stopped to see if they were okay. But when they were trying to hurry for the sake of the research team, only 10% of the seminary students uh, stopped and asked the person if they needed help. Uh, and most of those, uh, you know, you know, the 10% just uh, were the people that noticed something. The other 90% literally did not remember seeing a person laying on the street. So this shows that you have to notice that something is unusual uh, before you can actually intervene in an emergency. And by the way, uh, the uh, sermon they had to prepare was based on the idea of the parable of the Good Samaritan. Uh, which I find uh, uniquely uh, ironic uh, in this situation. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, the Good Samaritan parable is about uh, someone stopping to help somebody they find injured on the road. Once they identify something is going on, uh, they have to correctly interpret that that event is an emergency. Uh, and uh, usually when you're trying to interpret what the event is, is it normal, is it an emergency, you lack information. You just don't know what's going on. There are no sources of information available except social comparison. And as I've said before, social comparison is when you have no uh, objective uh, source standards to go with, so you just look to see what our other people are doing. And unfortunately, uh, when everybody has a lack of information, if you use social comparison, that runs into pluralistic ignorance. And for example, in Latin A. and Darley's 1968 smoke-filled room experiment, uh, what they did is they had subjects come into a room to fill out a questionnaire, and they had uh, other subjects doing the same thing, and then they start pumping smoke into the room and everybody just uh, kept on doing the questionnaire. They looked at each other, they looked at the smoke, they looked at each other, and then they went back to the questionnaire. Uh, some subjects actually had to fan the questionnaire to get the smoke out of the way so that they could read it. The smoke was so fish, uh, so thick, thick, excuse me. Uh, but Later on, when they interviewed the subjects, they said, well, yeah, I felt some type of steam or, or you know, mist was coming out of the door, but you know, it was not that bad. And the reason why uh, people didn't do anything is because of social comparison. Other people were not doing anything. So if other people weren't, then they weren't going to do anything uh, because they could look foolish saying, well, is that something we should worry about when everyone else is ignoring it? Uh, that leads to one of my favorite concepts, pluralistic ignorance. This is a situation where the majority of the group members privately reject a norm, but incorrectly assume that most others accept it, and therefore they go along with it. It's you know described as no one believes this, but everyone thinks that everyone else believes it. So I'm sitting there saying I don't believe that you know this is safe but everybody else seems to be acting as if this room is safe, so I'll continue to act as if it's safe. And everybody else is saying the exact same thing. That's pluralistic ignorance. And that really does inhibit uh, a lot of uh, you know, helping because people, and a lot of reactions to emergency, because people don't really identify it as an emergency because no one else is. And they're looking to see if anybody else is identifying it as an emergency. So let's say that you do uh, decide to identify this as an emergency. Now we're in stage three, and finally we talk about responsibility. And uh, so what they do is they decide whether or not they have the personal responsibility. Uh, and this is where Darley and Latinay's diffusion of responsibility would occur if it does. Well, it probably does occur, but. Uh, this is where it would occur. Uh, 
you know, people may think that a person in a leadership role will assume all responsibility. Once during a social psych class, uh, somebody came into my classroom and said, uh, there's a, uh, a woman in the woman's restroom next door and she's on the floor. And everybody looked at me because I was the leader and I was the professor and they expected me to do something. However, I'm not trained to do anything like this. Uh, but uh, I had, you know, it all worked out okay. Don't worry about it. We called the EMT uh, because I know about this. So I actually took action uh, even when security told me not to. Uh, and another thing about this responsibility stage is that people trained to respond to emergencies show no bystander effect. Uh, so that would say that, yeah, there is some type of responsibility, but being trained as a, a firefighter or an EMT, uh, you would know uh, how to take responsibility so that you would go ahead and do it. So the whole issue of the fusion of responsibility doesn't really apply to you. So let's say that you recognize the emergency, you take responsibility. Now, you have to decide that uh, you have the necessary knowledge and or skills to act. That is, uh, I see somebody choking. Uh, I know it's an emergency. I'm the only one there. It's me or nothing. Do I know what to do? Uh, I assume call 911, but then after that, what do I do? Uh, and so if I don't have special skills such as uh, artificial respiration uh, training, I may look to other people in the environment to see if they know what's going on. And again, that may lead to more pluralistic ignorance. And then finally, Darlene Latine, Latine say that the final step is to decide to help. And this step is when you think about the negative consequences to yourself and to the person you're going to help. That is, uh, if I hear my upstairs neighbor yelling, help, help, rape, do I bust into their apartment? What if they're playing a sex game? Oh my God, you know, that could be, you know, I could get beat up for that. Or if it's a real rape, what if the rapist is there, they could beat me up. Uh, or uh, I took artificial respiration training 35 years ago. Should I try AR since I don't clearly remember it? And so that I may hurt the uh, person trying to while I'm trying to help them. So these are Latin and Darley's steps that people have to go through to decide to help. Uh, and now that we have that under our belt, let's get to the real important issue about the bystander effect, which is construct validity. And construct validity is the idea of how we're operationalizing the constructs. That is, how valid are the operational definitions of the constructs. Operational definitions uh, is about operationalizing the construct and only the construct. That is, if I want to operationalize a bystander effect, I have to do something to operationalize this diffusion of responsibility bystander effect and just that, no other constructs. And one of the problems with construct validity is that you'll often operationalize the construct you want, but then you'll be operationalizing another construct that you're not even think of, thinking of. So that's the major problem with construct validity. So Darley and Latine, by changing or uh, varying the number of other bystanders, they may be varying the number of bystanders, and they be, may be varying the construct of diffusion of responsibility but they could be also varying another construct that they're not even aware of. And so all in all, construct validity is about, you know, knowing what the construct is, how it's operationalized, and if you're operationalizing that construct and only that construct. Uh, when we have issues like that, like are studies correctly operationalizing things, one way of organizing data is by a meta-analysis. And in fact, you can po possibly answer questions about construct validity uh, by looking at meta-analysis responses. And so back in 2011, uh, Fisher and uh, his colleagues 
uh, you know, uh, publish this meta-analysis of the bystander effect. And as an illustration of the what I've said is the benefits of a meta-analysis, they had in their meta-analysis 7,700 participants and 105 effect sizes, independent variables. And so uh, this is an example of how a meta-analysis can just combine so much data and you have this mega study. And that's one of the other benefits of a meta-analysis. But in this meta-analysis, they were able to uh, look at this issue of operational definitions and construct validity also. And just to remind you folks, effect size is the strength of a phenomenon, that is the strength of the relationship between the IV and DV. Uh, or you could just say, how big is the difference uh, between the conditions of the IV and the DV? Uh, of the DV, excuse me. Uh, effect size is dimensionless, that is you can compare one number from one study to another number uh, from another study as long as you have the same effect size measure. We've already talked about one effect size measure, which is Pearson's R, good old Pearson's R. Uh, when we're dealing with two groups and t-tests, we use Cohen's D as a measure of effect size for two group t-tests. And uh, that's just the mean of one group, subtracting out the mean of the other group, and dividing by the pooled sample size. And there's how you get the pooled sample size. So we could get a D value of 0.53, and then we would apply these rubrics. A 0.20 is a small effect size. Medium uh, effect size is 0.53, so that effect size is a medium effect size. And anything above 0.8 is a large effect size. And in analysis of variance, The measures of effect size are called omega squared and eta squared, and you've probably seen those already in this class. So uh, these are tables from Fisher's paper, and uh, you know already we can start to see uh, some really interesting things uh, related to some issues I've talked about. Because they had uh, sample sizes below 20, they used Hedges G over Cohen's D, uh, but you interpret Hedges G the same way with the same rubrics. Uh, and so let's take a look at some of the interesting things they found. Remember I mentioned that, well, what if, for example, uh, the perpetrator that is the harm doer is present or absent? Does that affect uh, the bystander effect? And indeed, look at this. Uh, oh, negative uh, you know, effect sizes mean there's a bystander effect. Positive means there's no bystander effect. And when you have uh, the perpetrator being absent, you do have a bystander effect. The more bystanders, the less anybody will help. However, look at this. When you have the perpetrator present, you have the complete opposite, an anti-bystander effect. That is, uh, when more people are there, more people will do something, uh, you know, uh, and stop what's going on and counter the perpetrator who's right there. Wow, that's interesting. Uh, I also mentioned the cost of intervention by the, for the bystander. When the costs are non-physical, embarrassment or lawsuits or something like that, threat of lawsuits, negative. So we do have a bystander effect. The more people there, the less likely you're going to act if you're afraid of being embarrassed. However, when the costs are physical, this is non-significant. So that means that this is essentially, we can think of it as zero. So there is neither a bystander effect or an anti-bystander effect. Uh, all that means is it doesn't matter how many people are there to, uh, in regards to whether or not anybody's going to respond or not. And now we get to the really interesting data from Fisher's study. Bystander instructions. A lot of these were experimental studies. Most of these were experimental studies. And so 
the bystanders are either going to be real subjects or they're going to be most likely confederates. And if they're confederates, they're going to be, let me clean this up. If they're confederates, they are going to probably be given instructions whether to don't do anything or to go and help the person in trouble. And, you know, the, you know, think about this. In the original Darley and Latin A study, the, uh, you, know, uh, you know, epilepsy study, uh, the uh, Confederates who didn't really exist, they were ultimately passive. And so what happens when you tell, in, when you tell the, uh, uh, you know, Confederates to actually go and help? Well, let's take a look. And notice this is the number of experiments. 51 experiments looked at whether or not the uh, you know, uh, bystanders were told, told to be passive. Only nine studies were found, and only nine studies looked at situations where they told the bystanders to actually help the person. And so what happens when you have passive or active bystanders? And when you have passive bystanders, that is the epilepsy study or the uh, smoke-filled room study, we have a negative value here, 0.53, so that's a moderate size correlation, and it's significant at the 0.001 level. Uh, we have a bystander effect in that when the other uh, you know, bystanders are just sitting there looking at you and looking at the victim, you just sit there and you look at the victim. You have a bystander effect. But look at what happens when the bystanders are told to go and help the victim. It's a positive sign, so that means there's an anti-bystander effect. It's a moderate-sized effect, and it's significant at the 0.001 level. And it's saying that if other people are helping, you're going to help. And you look at this and you say, oh my goodness, what we're dealing with is not a diffusion of responsibility, but what we're dealing with is just a plain old norm and conformity to a norm. And I can't write with my mouse, but conformity. That is, what's going on is not uh, you know, the fusion of responsibility, but what's going on is just conformity to what everyone else is doing. When other people just sit there and stare, you sit there and stare. You conform. When other people get up and do something, you get up and do something. So this really uh, shows that it's not the fusion of responsibility, but it's just conformity to what other people are doing. And so uh, in the last 10 years, what we've realized is that Darley and Latine and all the researchers that assume that we're talking about uh, you know, this diffusion of responsibility, they were getting it kind of wrong. It's not a diffusion of responsibility, which is really driving this bystander effect. It's the way we operationalize the construct, and we operationalize the construct by telling people, don't, you know, telling the Confederates, don't do anything, just sit there. And this is an example of we operationalize two things at the same time. We operationalize bystanders and bystanders doing nothing at the same time. And when we look at the results, we don't know if it's the effect of bystanders or the effect of bystanders doing nothing. And we know from the conformity chapter, the larger the group of bystanders, the greater the conformity pressure. So, of course, when you have more bystanders doing nothing, you're going to have more conformity pressure stopping uh, the subject from doing anything. So, uh, we're not really saying diffusion of responsibility does or does not exist, but what we're saying is the main driving force of this bystander inactivity or the Genovese effect is the fact that other people are not doing anything and we're conforming to them. And so just to review that because it's kind of complicated, 
Uh, in the bystander intervention studies, Confederates are ordered to be passive. And this creates the bystander effect because what we're doing is we're manufacturing pluralistic ignorance. You know, we can imagine that uh, you as the subject, you're sitting and saying, oh my God, I need to help that guy. He has, he's having an epileptic seizure. But, you know, the person whose mic's on, you know, they're not saying anything about doing anything. Or if you're, uh, if you're on a street and you see somebody fall down on the street and everybody else is not doing anything, uh, you know, and they're just looking uh, and they're Confederates, then uh, you're going to follow the conformity pressure. And you're going to basically assume that, well, I want to help. Uh, but nobody else is helping, so I'm going to go with this norm. And, of course, it's not really a norm because they're Confederates. They're not real people. Uh, and the research, if you drill down to it, shows that if you have one Confederate act, uh, then you get a lot of helping. And, of course, this is uh, a reflection of that uh, social support effect or the helper effect that I talked about or the true partner effect from uh, the social influence chapter. Just having one person backing you up uh, usually uh, reduces any effect of conformity or obedience to authority. So, as I said, diffusion of responsibility cannot be the cause or the only cause of the bystander effect. It has to be uncertainty and it has to be the fact that you're following this norm created by the Confederates. And actually this is really useful information because uh, if you are you know, a victim of an emergency, uh, then what you should do is at least get one person to help you. Because once you get one person to help you, you overcome that pluralistic ignorance and everyone says, oh, I should help. And if you've ever seen people helping in an emergency, that's exactly what happens. Somebody has an emergency, nobody does anything, and then one person helps. And then immediately you have like five people standing around the person. And how can you get people to help you if you're in trouble? Well, think about Saldini and compliance. Uh, you want to single out a person. You, uh, you know, you there in the red shirt. That is, you want to create a relationship. Uh, that is, friendship or relationship. Or you, what's your name? Bob, Bob, can you do something for me? Bob's already positively responded to you by giving you his name. So now... Uh, what you can do is you can build on that and uh, Bob is uh, you know bound by consistency uh, to continue to help you because he already began to help you. So a couple tricks uh, from a social psychologist on how to get people to help you. So that's one of the current reflections on uh, Catherine Genovese's murder and the Genovese effect and the bystander effect and diffusion of responsibility. But also over the last uh, 10 years, there's been a reevaluation of the murder of Catherine Genovese herself and the reevaluation of how the press treated Catherine Genovese. She was always referred to, or most often referred to, as Kitty Genovese. And remember that horrible, uh, you know, grainy photo. I think it might have been actually a mugshot of her when she was arrested for, uh, you know, some trivial uh, crime a couple years earlier. Uh, but there are other photos of her. This is one before she's going to a wedding uh, as a guest. <clears throat> and... One of the reasons why Catherine Genovese received such bad press, even though that she was the victim of a horrible murder, was that she was a lesbian. Uh, and back in the 1960s, that was not uh, at all understood or respected. And she was, at the time, uh, living with a female partner. And again, that was something that was unheard of in America at that time. And so part of the stereotype and stigma against lesbians and against homosexuality uh, you know, uh, affected how the press treated her. 
And in a way, it affected how the murder was reported. Uh, so when you actually investigate, and even at the time, police knew this, when you actually investigate what happened, uh, you find out it's not what was reported in the press. Uh, for example, uh, after uh, Genovese was stabbed the first time, uh, one resident of the apartment building across the street, Robert Moser, yelled, uh, leave that girl alone. That caused Mosley to run away. Uh, and so there you have bystander intervention immediately and timely. Uh, right after that, you had two calls to the police department. Uh, the only real case of bystander apathy was Joseph Fink. Uh, he was a uh, you know, janitor of the large apartment building. And he heard the first attack. He was asleep. Uh, he was in the sleeping in the boiler room. And he heard the attack. He s heard someone yell, leave that girl alone, saw Mosley run away. And so he went back to sleep. Uh, and in the video, uh, they talked about Carl Ross. Uh, the second attack occurred outside of his apartment, in the hallway outside of his apartment. Well, again, this was a coincidence. Ross was gay. And if during the 1960s, one thing gay men knew was not to get involved with the police because the police were very antagonistic and brutal towards gay people for no reason at all. Uh, and so Ross was very concerned, concerned enough that he crawled out his window across the roof to a friend's apartment, talked to his friend, and the friend and uh, Ross decided to call the police. And then uh, finally, when the ambulance came for Genovese, uh, Genovese was being comforted by a neighbor of hers, Sophia Farrar. So uh, the whole story of 38 witnesses not doing anything really was more of a fabrication or an exaggeration by uh, the press or the police or the prosecutors uh, than it is reality. And in fact, at the time, uh, a police and prosecutor evaluated the case and they said that in terms of an actual legal witness to the murder, uh, there was probably two or three or four witnesses to the murder. And of course, we already know how three of those responded. And they responded positively, uh, you know, or at least positively in the end, or not at all. So uh, the whole story about uh, Genovese's uh, murder uh, really deserved to be reviewed and this revisionist history deserved to be uh, discussed. And since it took place uh, here in Queens, oh, it's actually working. Well, I, having problems with the videos and embedding them and getting them to work. So I didn't expect that to work actually. And where did it go now? So I uh, just looked at Google and in case you're interested, uh, here's where it occurred. Uh, Mowbray and Austin. And this parking lot was there at the time. A uh, bank was there and uh, stores were there. Uh, when Genovese came home from work, she parked her car here in this parking lot. And, uh, you know, uh, you know Mosley followed her, parked his car in the same lot, and first assaulted her right about there. So let's continue on a little bit. Yep, there's the lot. And let's go forward. And there's more of the parking lot. And there we go. Uh, this, I believe, is the entrance to uh, Genovese's apartment. Uh, this is where Ross lived in this apartment. Uh, so possibly he came out the back door or came out his back window and climbed up on the roof and walked down here. Uh, what happened was Mosley first assaulted Genovese around right here. And 
then what happened was she was confused because she had been stabbed and she wandered back into the parking lot before turning around and coming back in here and getting into the entrance way to her apartment and Mosley was able to get through the door of the apartment and finally ended up killing her there. And here are the apartment buildings across the apartment building across the street. And the image of that apartment building really uh, was uh, what was uh, one of the major drivers. Let me see if I can get, there we go. One of the major drivers of the stories about all of the 38 uh, witnesses. Because you can imagine that there's a lot of people in these buildings, but then again, it was 3 a.m. and they were asleep. So uh, that, wait, how do I get out of here now? Oh, there we go. So uh, that's exactly where it happened over in Kew Gardens. All right, now our final topic for today is about morality and helping. Uh, people help because they want to be moral. And the thing is that people different people have different morality. And I'm not just saying that as a truism, but uh, psychologists have been looking at major differences between people you could kind of categorize as conservatives and people that you could categorize as liberals. And it appears that one group of individuals has a different set of morality than the other, and we can uh, you know, fair, be very specific in terms of what we're talking about. To introduce that idea to you, let's talk about this image from four years ago during uh, the last presidential campaign. Donald Trump Jr. tweeted this. Uh, if I had a bowl of Skittles and I told you that three would kill you, would you take a handful? That's our Syrian refugee problem. Uh, now, I don't know if Donald Trump Jr. knew about this, but this whole bowl full of candy and you know, a couple of them are poison. Uh, that was Nazi propaganda about the Jews. So I don't know if he actually knew he was, you know, spreading Nazi propaganda or using it. Uh, but then again, America caused the Syrian refugee problem. So to say that we should uh, wash our hands of the Syrian refugees seems, uh, you know, not that uh, honest or moral. And, uh, you know, people responded with tweets such as this, you know, that is the chance of an American being murdered in a terrorist attack is one in 3.6 billion. So not three out of a handful of M&Ms. And then the director, John Farvo, tweeted this. And this is one of your uh, Skittles. And uh, again, if you don't know about Syria and what the United States has done to Syria and what's going on in Syria right now and how the Trump administration has abandoned Syria, you should look it up, read some articles and educate yourself about that. Uh, but that makes perfect sense what Donald Trump Jr. is saying about what's the moral decision in that case makes perfect sense when you think about the division of morality between liberals and conservatives. Uh, John Haidt is a psychologist who does a lot of research on the moral mind, as he calls it. And Haidt has identified what he calls five channels of moral decision making. And these are the five dimensions in which human beings evaluate things uh, when they're thinking about morality. And uh, these five dimensions are harm and care. Uh, that is, we evaluate decisions as moral versus immoral based on whether or not we're hurting somebody or, controversially, we're taking care of somebody or we're not hurting somebody. So uh, a moral decision is, well, we can't do that because that will cause harm to people. And so we're not going to do that because of our morality. Another uh, you know, channel of morality is fairness reciprocity. That is, decisions are made because they're moral based on the idea of uh, equitably or fairly distributing things or reciprocity. That is, if 
you put in something, you should get something out of it. And so we evaluate decisions based on, well, uh, earlier this semester, as a class, you decided that if you didn't contribute to uh, lecture notes or uh, test notes or exam notes, you shouldn't be able to benefit from them. And we uh, would make that decision based on reciprocity. You can only get out what you put in. If you put in nothing, you should not be able to get out anything. Another channel is in-group loyalty. Uh, that is, we do things because we want to show that we're loyal to our in-group or that we treat our in-group as uh, special. Uh, so uh, our family is important, and we're doing this because uh, it's for our family. And that would be a moral decision based on the channel of in-group loyalty. Uh, authority and respect. Uh, this channel of morality is that we do things that are moral uh, because we want to respect uh, our society or we want to respect the or follow the authority of leaders of our society. And so, for example, uh, you know, everybody else is smoking weed, but I'm not because it's still against the law. Uh, and that would be an example of a moral decision based on authority respect. And then the fifth channel is purity sanctity. Uh, and that is you're doing things to basically keep things the way they should be. And that's probably the best way to describe this. Uh, and purity and sanctity are, are really extreme terms that really don't get the general sense of this uh, channel. That is, it's important that things be kept in their original state. Uh, that is, if uh, you break it, you pay for it. That's a purity, sanctity, moral decision or moral rule. Uh, or uh, you unlock a room, you lock it up. Uh, you know, you use a tool, you return it to the person you borrowed it from in the same state that you uh, borrowed it. That's purity, sanctity. And uh, so let's see, what do we go to next? Yep. And I'm going to skip this for now and I should remember to change this part of the lecture or the lecture slides and skipped straight to how liberals versus conservatives use these different channels. Haight found that people who are considered liberals uh, they only work with two channels of morality harm care and fairness reciprocity. Conservatives use all five channels. So in-group loyalty, authority, and purity sanctity uh, are the channels that conservatives use to make moral decisions that liberals don't. And if you go back to this, this is really a classic idea in the distinct. And so when we go back to Donald Trump Jr., uh, he's probably conservative. And now compare that to me. Uh, I'm a liberal, and you probably guessed that I'm a liberal, and our thinking about the Syria problem illustrates that. Why are you not going forward? Oh, there we go. Okay, so to Trump, the conservative, uh, all five channels are important, and one of those channels is purity sanctity. Uh, that is, we need to keep America, America. We shouldn't let in things that could hurt us. We shouldn't let in impurities that will hurt us. Also, in-group favoritism. Uh, we can't be helping Syrians when we need to help ourselves. And that would be an example of conservative five-channel moral thinking. What you saw with me is an example of liberal two-channel thinking. Uh, well, it's really an issue of care. Uh, we have, you know, this is another human being. We have to care for them, or we have to do things uh, in Syria to make sure that they're no longer they're not harmed anymore. And that makes perfect sense to me, a liberal, but to conservatives, that uh, is not all of the picture. There's other issues that we need to address that uh, 
you know, get to the issue of morality. And uh, I think that conservatives will agree that this is horrible and that we should, if we could, do things to care for uh, you know, the uh, victims of what's going on, the genocide that's going on in Syria. Uh, but they would say there's other things we need to look at. We need to look at, you know, we can't let them into America because some are terrorists. And that, you know, uh, means an end to purity. And we have to respect, you know, that they're a different group, uh, our in-group favoritism. And so we see that conservatives and liberals have different, uh, you know, uh, understandings of morality. And this is a good example. And now I can come back to here because what tends to happen is that these last three conservative channels, sometimes they go to extremes. And of course, I would have to say that also you can take fairness, reciprocity, and harm care to extremes also. But oftentimes we see uh, problems with society from uh, the conservative channels becoming extreme. When we talk about in-group loyalty, in-group loyalty is a good thing. That is, recognizing that my family is more important than your family to me or that my country is more important to me than your country. But that general concept when taken to extreme becomes xenophobia which is fear of foreigners or fear of anything foreign. Authority is good. That is, we need to have order and we have order by obeying authority. But if we take that to the extreme, we get to authoritarianism. And purity is good. Having things the way that they deserve to be is good. Uh, having uh, a healthy society, uh, for example, not having uh, the coronavirus, that's good. But then that moral channel taken to extreme is puritanism, which is the uh, you know censoring and the punishment of any type of uh, extreme or unusual source of enjoyment or physical enjoyment. And so, just to reiterate, uh, in-group favoritism's dark side is xenophobia, and we see that in America. Hopefully we won't see it anymore, but probably we will. Uh, with the idea of this wall, of keeping the outsiders out and keeping us in. Uh, authority respects dark side as authoritarianism. That is, the belief in the authority figure no matter what they say. And in the last month or so, we've seen you know extra strong authoritarianism, uh, where Donald Trump beats the coronavirus and tells everybody it's nothing but sniffles and he's the big powerful authoritarian leader. And then purity's dark side is puritarianism, uh, sensuous moral beliefs especially about self-indulgence and sex. And again Donald Trump uh, wants to overly uh, control sexuality uh, he wanted to uh, ban, overturn Roe versus Wade and outlaw abortions. Uh, he wanted uh, to defund, and he in fact did defund Planned Parenthood because Planned Parenthood encourages people well, to have abortions. About 4% of the people that go to Planned Parenthood. The other 96% uh, that go to Planned Parenthood, they get birth control. No, not all 96%. They get birth control so they could have sex whenever they want. And so again, Puritanism is this idea that we want to uh, you know, control or punish uh, any type of self-indulgence or sex. And so, whoop, uh, you know, it comes down to the basic fact of conservatives and liberals evaluate different mor uh, moral questions differently. And while I focused on the negatives of the 
three conservative channels and we could say that what was going on in America was a overabundance of xenophobia, authoritarianism, and puritism in America. There are situations where the two liberal channels of fairness and care, uh, they can go to overabundance also. Uh, for example, uh, the 70s. The 1970s was uh, an era of the overabundance of these liberal channels where we were trying to be overly fair for everybody. Uh, we were trying to be, uh, you know, uh, careful about individuals' desires and wants. And we kind of forgot about xenophobia. We kind of forgot about in-group loyalty. We finally, we kind of forgot about authority. We finally got, forgot about purity. And what did we get? Uh, we ended up at the end of the 1970s uh, with the uh, HIV virus starting to spread uh, through sexually active populations, uh, which ended up being a major, uh, you know, pandemic, epidemic and pandemic uh, that we're still dealing with today. Uh, we uh, also had an erosion of, for example, authority, uh, and especially in our economic system. And so during most of the 1970s, we had horrible uh, recessions and depressions uh, because there was no order or structure in our uh, economic system or our political system. New York City went uh, broke and the federal government wouldn't help us. And so you can see that uh, if you go all in for this liberal ideology and this liberal morality, things can end up pretty bad. Likewise, if you go all in for this conservative morality, things can end up pretty bad. And in fact, current thinking about this uh, is that uh, the, and this is what hate uh, strongly feels, uh, these moral channels and conservatism and liberalism are tied to uh, genetics because what happens is if one of these, uh, you know, uh, channels, one of these groups, conservatives or liberals, become overly powerful in the society, you end up in a bad place. Uh, and so it's good to have the other group to save your society from the bad place that the other group took you. And, well, then, after a while, you end up in the bad place of the other group. And so it's good that you have the other group there uh, to come out and bring you back away from the bad place of the liberal side. And so what he's saying is that, based on, on uh, evolutionary psychology, it's adaptive to have this diversity of morality among different people. Because one morality... Uh, you know, by itself will lead to negative spaces. And so you need the balance between the two. And uh, that's the current thinking. And if you think about it, the idea of balance, uh, that is, you know, if one group controls too much, they tend to lead us into a bad place in society. And we need the other group to oppose them and bring us out of it. That does make sense and it does sound very familiar. By the way, uh, I mentioned uh, my morality. I'm a liberal. And uh, so as a liberal, I uh, am uh, you know, really devoted to uh, fairness and reciprocity and harm care, you know, caring for people and avoiding harm. Uh, you know, what really taxes my, more, uh, my liberal morality is this. This is an ad for the decriminalization or the legalization of sex working or sex workers, that is prostitution. And the argument from the liberal side is very clear, uh, fairness. Sex workers are workers like anybody else and their work should not be, uh, you, know, uh, you, know, you know, especially identified as bad 
and they should have all the protections that society guarantees me as a college professor. Uh, and, you know, uh, also arguments about the fairness. You know, they say, well, you know, sex workers are different because they use their body for their jobs. And, you know, the argument against that is tell that to a coal miner uh, where they destroy their bodies for their job. Uh, however, I didn't include sex work. And, of course, let me uh, finish the idea. And conservatives are dead against it based on purity uh, and puritism. That is, this excess focus on sexuality not being controlled uh, is something abhorrent to conservatives and that prostitutes and, and sex workers should still be illegal. Uh, and this is a difficult call for me as a uh, you know, liberal because I understand the arguments about fairness and that you know, once you legalize or decriminalize prostitution, police can now protect them, so that's certainly caring for them more. But what really gets me is the problems associated with sex trafficking. And sex trafficking is, occurs when uh, someone uses force, fraud, or coercion to cause a sexual, uh, commercial sexual act uh, to be committed between an adult and an adult or an adult and a minor. And it is just horrible. And if you don't know about it, uh, you should, you know, again, educate yourself because it's very frightening. Uh, about 40% of the sex trafficking cases involve minors. So the victims are children. Children are being forced into sexual activity. Over 50% of adults were first exploited when they were children. Uh, and they're exp uh, you know, explicitly targeting homeless children. And to me, I can't see how you can sexualize, you know, how you can decriminalize sex work without encouraging, uh, you know, uh, you know, sex trafficking of children and or adults. And uh, in coming up with this lecture, I discovered something that really surprised me. Uh, back in 2003, New Zealand decriminalized prostitution. And so what happened in New Zealand after they decriminalized prostitution after a couple of years? Uh, sex workers uh, were 70% more likely to report violence to themselves to the police after the legalization. So there you go with harm care. Uh, now they're getting more care uh, from the police. And uh, the number uh, of sex workers in New Zealand decreased from about 6,000 to 2,000 after decriminalization. Uh, and also, uh, you know, sexual uh, trafficking uh, and sex trafficking dropped almost to nothing in New Zealand. And then also, uh, HIV infections among sex workers after decriminalization went from 46% down to 30%. So, uh, I, as a liberal, I have to accept what the liberals say about sex work, that it should be decriminalized. But if you notice that uh, some of these things are palatable to conservatives, that is, having fewer prostitutes is palatable to conservatives, having fewer uh, you know, infections of a disease is palatable to conservatives, uh, and possibly having more respect to authority is palatable to conservatives. So once you understand these five different channels, you have a better ability to understand exactly uh, what, is a, uh, what you can do to explain different actions and different things to liberals and conservatives uh, to possibly win their support. And so that's it for today's uh, lecture. Hopefully 2020 will be turning a corner now, though I don't want to jinx it. All right, I'll see you in uh, you know, synchronous class on Wednesday or Thursday or in office hours on Tuesday. Bye-bye.